Hello. We were going to talk about how 20 years after her death, Aliyah's albums were finally hitting streaming services and digital platforms. But then a post dropped on social media from the late singer's mother. Diane Houghton wrote on Instagram, Due to the behavior of an individual that has been to Aliyah's resting place in order to promote a book, I've been forced to make a drastic change at Ferncliff Cemetery and Mausoleum. This person interrupted all my thoughts and ideas to make August 25th, 2021 a day of remembrance and love for my daughter. Please accept my sincere apologies for this and know I love you and always will. What she's talking about is having to cancel the memorial service for the pop singer. And who she's talking about is my guest, Kathy Ayandoli, author of the book Baby Girl, better known as Aaliyah. So, Kathy, you're calling Diane Houghton's accusations offensive. Why do you think she's making them? Well, the thing is, I just want to make it very clear that I wasn't promoting my book outside of Aaliyah's gravesite. I know that there were some people who had the book with them while they were visiting. Um, and showing pictures and things like that. I wasn't one of those people that I find that offensive to me because I didn't do it. Um, and I also put in my statement, as you recall, that I said, if anyone had the book at the cemetery to please stop doing that. So, and why the family would be upset if I was out there with my book, posting photos and everything, because that would be horrible. But that. I rest assured that was not me. So that, you know, while the statement didn't specify who they were talking about, they were talking more about the book and an individual promoting it, but that was not me. Okay. Nor was it anyone in my publisher or anyone who represents me. So just to make it clear, Cassie, did you go to Aaliyah's resting place after your book was published? Yeah, I've actually visited Aliyah's resting place a number of times over the years as a fan of hers. And on the day that my book came out, I brought her flowers. If that's the gesture that she's referencing, I, I wouldn't take that as book promotion, but I brought her flowers. And uh, did you make the public know about this? Yes, I have in the past posting photos that we were there, but it wasn't one of those things where there's a picture of a book and a photo and come buy my book. It was the day people had been asking me, where did you spend it? And I basically said, this is where I spent it. And I had flowers. Okay. And you mentioned a group of fans that had your book with them as they visited uh, Elias' grave. Uh, how do you know that uh, her estate is referring to this as they are accusing you of promoting your book? I'm honestly not sure. Um, you know, the most important thing is that Aliyah's 20th anniversary was yesterday, and with her career, she has such an incredible career. Her music is available for streaming. People are now putting her name back in the conversation in a positive light, and going forward, I'd like to keep it that way. Okay, so uh, before we start talking about the book, I want to ask how it made you feel when you heard that uh, you know, her memorial service would be cancelled because of, you know, what she thinks uh, you've done. I felt terrible for the fans. I wish that if it was something that they thought it was me, they would contact me directly. And, you know, we could have spoken about the situation instead of making all the fans suffer because they were taking flights and they were showing up. But they still did show up from what I heard and they did have their own celebration, the fans, that is. So, you know, I think that there's, it's a situation where at this point, you know, as long as we're celebrating Aliyah, that's really all that matters. Okay. Tell us why you came up with this book, uh, Baby Girl, better known as Aliyah. Yes, absolutely. This is a book to honor Aliyah, who had a short seven year career. And then in the 20 years after her passing, she's still so relevant, still so amazing and still has this fan base who every year wants to go and honor her. Okay, so uh, I wonder if you had Elias' estate on board as you were writing this book. I actually went to them first to ask them if they'd like to participate and they didn't. And I still wanted to move forward with a book that honors Aliyah and I still stand by the book and I hope that whomever buys the book, enjoys it. But that was the real intention is to um, honor Aaliyah. 
And do you know why they didn't give their blessing to this book? Is there a particular reason why? I'm not entirely sure because we didn't get into a book process at all to even know what the details were or anything. I, I just went to them first and asked if they'd like to participate. I, I really don't know what the exact reasoning is. Okay, and um, do you know how they reacted to this book? I'm not sure they read it. I don't, I, when they, if and when they do read it, they'll enjoy it. <laughs> okay, so... Um... I've seen on Twitter that some fans are actually angry at you, saying that you've, you're using Aaliyah for monetary gain. What do you mm -hmm. say to that? That is absolutely not my intention. I've been writing about music for 22 years, and it's never been my goal to profit off of another artist, especially their legacy. This was a book to honor Aaliyah. There are plenty of books about artists that are not written with the estate approval, that are not written with the even approval of an artist who is still walking the earth. So I wrote a book about an artist who I am a huge fan of. And I think that in a world where it's so accessible to reach people, we're seeing more of, you know, fans speaking, but they're also coming from a place of upset because they weren't able to go visit her her cemetery, which I can understand why they'd be upset. So it's a touchy situation, but it doesn't take away from the, back, uh, the fact that I'm proud of the book and I stand by it. And I think, Kathy, what annoys uh, some of the fans is that you're covering many points of Elias' personal life in this book, uh, including uh, the possibility that she may have been drugged before uh, boarding on her final flight, which took her life, uh, as we all know. These mm -hmm. details are something that the family and her estate uh, wanted to keep private all along. Do you think, uh, as some fans put it, this is disrespecting mm -hmm. her legacy? Or why did you think that these were worth discussing? Well, I think if you think about the first part um, with regard to anything involving R. Kelly, he's currently on trial for the same crimes that I put in the book. So that is not personal information. That's not private information. It's widely public. Most of what I put in that book has already been spoken about over the years. This was more to put it all together and show a narrative of an incredible artist. As far as the drugging comment, I've never said once in the book that she was drugged and put on a plane. That is something that came from a headline that was not a part of my book. I said that after she didn't want to fly and headlines tended to run wild with it. The fact of the matter is I can't control what the media or what social media do with headlines. All I can say is that if there are any other questions, it's all in the book. Okay, so uh, unfortunately we don't have much time uh, to delve deeper into mm -hmm. this, but before we mm -hmm. wrap up, just one final question, because there is this tension between you and the estate now. Uh, do you think her mm -hmm. estate is doing a good job uh, protecting Elias' legacy? I can't speak on how uh, families are protecting their children's legacy. I, I, that, I wouldn't do that. I respect the family too much, regardless of any statements that were made or anything you know, I, I respect Ali as a state and I have the utmost respect for her family. So to say what is a good job versus a bad job, that's not my place. All right. Thanks so much for this. Uh, Kathy Ayandoli, it was lovely having you with us today. Thank you. Bangkok may be the biggest city most affected by climate change right now. Researchers warn that in the next 10 to 30 years, much of the city could be underwater. But one architect is determined to change this dire prediction. This is Chulalongkorn University Centennial Park. World Landscape Architecture said it's the first critical piece of green infrastructure for the city of Bangkok. And it's all thanks to renowned landscape architect Kochikorn Vorokom. That was in 2018. A year later, her firm, Land Process, created Asia's largest rooftop farm in central Bangkok, Pui Centennial Hall at Thammasat University. It includes a farm, rice fields and a jogging path. For Vodacom, this is more than just adding green to some grey buildings. Green roof has protect 
um, the use of the energy in the building because you reduce heat to come into the buildings, uh, but uh, but you also reflect heat outside your um, the environment. So it's actually benefit both way. And also, when you're saving the energy, you don't open air conditioning, which also, of course, you um, put all the heat outside, which is like make it even worse. Vodacom is everywhere these days, from TED Talks to Time Magazine's list of 100 next rising stars. But in the Thai capital, where economic growth is the priority, she says it's not easy for her to persuade customers for environmentally friendly designs. Still, she strives to bring the city into harmony with the environment. Vodacom also focuses on greening Bangkok to tackle another problem, the urban heat island. The city is so exposed to human activities that it deals with higher temperatures than the surrounding areas. Eco-friendly designs, such as Vodacom's green roofs, aim to prevent a big problem in urban areas. Structures are absorbing and then putting out energy, effectively becoming what are called heat islands. If we can turn this kind of problematic space into such a solution, for many more, for urban heat island, for food security, and also teaching a younger generation with so many of this impact of climate. I think we will be better off having the balance of developing the city and also not too much focus to create a problem of urban heat island. This year, prestigious events from the Venice Architecture Biennale to the World Architecture Festival focused on the climate crisis. The event simply asked one question, can architectural designs solve the climate crisis? For Vodacom, the answer is a definite yes, but only if we choose to. Germany's Tegel Airport closed down for good back in November, but because of COVID-19 restrictions, Berliners didn't get to say a proper goodbye. And a group of sound artists want to make up for that. Outwardly, Tegel Airport doesn't show many signs of the days when it was a legendary German hub. But step inside and things change a bit. This is the final boarding call for all passengers booked on the last flight out of Berlin T. Final boarding call is a sound installation and it's Son Ambiente Berlin's way of giving a proper Auf Wiedersehen to a piece of history. Also Im November wurde der the airport was closed Sand last November without any fanfare. It just stopped operating. There wasn't any chance for people to bid farewell to the airport, to say goodbye and remember what was here. During these two weeks, we just want to open this window, because it is definitely the very last chance to see this airport just the way it was made. In 1948, the French military built the first runway. Commercial flights began in the 60s. It was a small airport, always over capacity, but it was also a symbol of freedom being one of the few ways to get out of West Berlin during Soviet occupation. Berliners didn't want to let go of the place, but they were overruled by the local government. So they get one more time to wander around. Susan Phillips is among them. She created what she calls ambient air. She recorded it by circling the area in a small plane. It's quite a plaintive tune. I mean, this, if you listen, it's quite melancholic. So I think maybe that might make you think of the airport, you know, that it's no longer functioning, that it's closing now. So it's a kind of like a, a, a farewell, but it also makes you look at, at the architecture, draws attention to the, the space. Right now, that space is drawing the attention of entrepreneurs. They're investing around $10 billion, money that'll be spent on a scientific and industrial research complex. 
But before all that, it's the Son Ambiente Festival, just before the new Tegel project prepares to take off. Charlie Watts has died. The Rolling Stones drummer was 80 years old. Watts was the group's longest serving member, outside of Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. Watts had said a health issue was keeping him from the band's tour this year. Brian Travers, one of the founding members of the British reggae group UB40, has died. He was the band's saxophone player and songwriter. The band has sold over 70 million records and toured the world six times. They were also the worldwide number one in 1983, with a cover of Neil Diamond's Red Red Wine. A trailer for the upcoming Spider-Man sequel, Spider-Man No Way Home, has been released. Tom Holland is once again Peter Parker. This time around, Peter gets to take his mask off, as his secret identity has already been revealed in 2019's Spider-Man Far From Home. The movie will be released exclusively in theaters in December. The first official poster for the drama Spencer, based on Princess Diana's life, has been released. It features Kristen Stewart as Diana, who is dressed in a stunning white gown. The release comes ahead of the film's world premiere at the Venice Film Festival on September the 3rd. The Amman International Film Festival has opened its doors for the second time. The festival is featuring 51 films from 26 countries. This year's focus is on first-time directors in order to highlight young talent in the region. The festival also includes masterclasses, panel discussions and pitching sessions. Hitler infamously was an artist before he became a mass-murdering dictator. And during his reign of terror, he still followed a number of artists. What happened to them after Germany lost the war and Hitler was no longer a solid reference on their resumes? Well, there is a new exhibit in Berlin which tells that exact story. Adolf Hitler added this painting to his private collection just a year before he committed suicide. It depicts a German cruiser sinking a British ship. The person who made it was among the 378 artists Hitler and company listed as indispensable and were exempt from military duty. And now an exhibition in Berlin called Divinely Gifted asks, what happened to these people when Allied bombs crushed the Nazis? All artists that were successful during the time of National Socialism and worked afterwards had to conform. They couldn't make the same art, but they had to work with certain themes that the National Socialists thought were relevant. That is to say, when Hitler fell, they pivoted to working for churches, banks and office buildings. Not so grandiose, but it was more than a decent living. And although the curator thinks the realism and neoclassical movement of the time is now passé, they still draw the public's lingering interest. This was really not our intention, but I think that a lot of people will like some of the works that they can see here. From a pure technical perspective, they were not bad artists, but it really isn't modern art. People that like modern art after 1945 will be disappointed by these works. And people will also be disappointed if they think any artist loved by Nazis should be erased from history. For as the exhibit shows, their art graces the public squares, facades and theatres in many of Germany's major cities. An exhibition in Istanbul is raising awareness about the damage contemporary agricultural methods have on the environment. Nursen Atutar attended the opening at the Salt Bayol Gallery. You have most likely heard carnivore, omnivore, pescatarian, vegetarian or vegan. 
but now, an exhibition at Istanbul Salt Beyoğlu Gallery proposes another term, climavore. A London-based duo called Cooking Sections work on the contemporary practices of how we produce and consume food depending on location. They suggest that as the climate crisis rapidly changes seasons in agricultural regions, our modern ways of infrastructure triggers environmental problems. And we end up living in a vicious cycle of damage and consumption. To broach the subject, they're mixing art with scientific and historical research to inspire sustainable daily solutions. Uh, Climate War is actually a, a, a project that Cooking Sections has been working on intensely for over a few years. And they have been speaking of the ways how food is engaged with the climate, which means that how food affects and is affected by the climate. Um, and we have worked with Cooking Sections for over three years to uh, s specify five cases uh, that would help us understand the geography that Turkey is in today uh, in its, um, in a sense, historical entirety uh, to see these relations with food uh, in terms of climate. As curator Meric Önar says, cooking sections focus on Turkey and its climates. In 1941, the Turkish Ministry of Education identified seven different geographical regions in Turkey distinguishing them depending on climate, topography and agriculture. Here you can see promotional ads from the 1950s on hybrid seeds and chemical interference. The work cites how disruptive those approaches have been through everything from records of drafts to the use of statues honoring fertility gods. And in this work, Two Turkish fishermen speak a local language that's spoken by chirping like a bird. They're from the Black Sea region and they're discussing how worried they are that they're seeing fish that belong to warmer seas. Another installation about seafood practices is called Traces of Escapees. A voiceover narrates a real story of farmed fish escaping and mixing their DNA with other fish. New existential traces connect known life forms. What happens if farmed fish escape and move to bigger seas? This installation talks about the genetic changes in fish because of the way we consume food. And these ceramic bowls tell the story of a buffalo farming business in Istanbul. Cooking sections track the wallowing path of local water buffaloes and helped enlarge the wetland for the animals. These ceramics traditionally either hold yogurt or rice pudding made out of buffalo milk. And to make it sustainable, after the exhibition, the bowls will be given to related businesses in Istanbul. Salt Gallery is also gifting a bowl of rice pudding to one visitor every day as a souvenir. Actually, the long-term goal of this project by Cooking Sections to have uh, these people trained with this mindset uh, of using uh, this very particular product uh, and keep it with them throughout their lives as, as, an, uh, as a way of changing uh, how we eat uh, in Istanbul, for instance. As the duo documents what has happened to nature over the years, Cooking Sections is also trying to name the new seasons that we experience today. But the biggest emphasis is on predicting what would happen if we didn't change our practices. Nur Senat Tutar, TRT World, Istanbul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Milf Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.